The classic Klingon D7 cruiser is distinctive, iconic, and a very cool looking warship. But does it make any sense at all, especially with the long vulnerable neck or boom section there? Let's break the design down together and I'll tell you what I think. After you watch this video, you can rush to the comments and tell me what you think, like the smart audience that you are. That is, except those of you who put a comment like, well it's a science fiction TV show. They did that because it looks cool, well duh, but we can be smarter than that. The 3D model I'm using here is my own creation, and another interpretation of the old D7 before these cruisers were upgraded to the Katinga class we see in Star Trek The Motion Picture. Basically it is the ship I think we could see if a new modern Star Trek show took place in the time of Kirk, preserving all the classic features of the D7, but mildly enhancing the ship very much like what I did with the old Constitution class shown in other videos. Okay, let's review the basics of the D7 class battlecruiser. Like most Star Trek ships, it is somewhat modular. It has two low slung warp nacelles that enable faster than light speeds, which are a good distance away from the core of the ship and within line of sight of each other. This agrees with the usual rules of warp nacelles for Starfleet ships as well. There is a main drive section here which contains the engineering section, engines for the impulse drive, shuttle bay, cargo bays, and lower ranking crew quarters. There is a long neck or boom section that connects to a forward pod. This forward pod section contains the bridge, main sensors, officer quarters, and other administrative facilities. It is technically not known if the older D7s had a torpedo launcher here in the front, or if torpedoes were just an upgrade for the Katinga. All the various types of D7 cruisers might be a topic for another video. And of course it has heavy disruptor turrets covering the forward firing arcs and lighter disruptors covering the rest of the ship. It is important to keep in mind that the boom and forward pod can easily separate from the main drive section and it has its own self-contained impulse drive. It may even have some limited warp capability. The long separation between the forward pod and the main drive section is the big mystery that has haunted the minds of Star Trek geeks for over 50 years now. After all, isn't this an extremely vulnerable way to design a warship where concentrated fire on this neck pretty much beheads the ship and takes it out? Now I've been scouring the internet and reading much of my audience's comments on why this ship is the way it is. Let's start with some of the basic theories. One very interesting proposal is that the neck is part of a sort of spinal mounted weapon built into the ship, perhaps the torpedo launcher or some kind of disruptor cannon on the front. Sure, so perhaps the Klingons always intended the forward section to have a torpedo launcher like the Katinga, but photon torpedoes weren't quite ready for the first D7, so we have either a navigational deflector dish like the Enterprise or a heavy disruptor here like we saw by the time of Star Trek DS9. But the neck is still there in preparation for a torpedo launcher. The problem with this is that the opening in the front of the ship is not in direct line of sight of the neck. So if you're accelerating a torpedo down the neck, it would have to make an unlikely sharp turn down a couple of decks to come out of this opening. So this theory is unlikely. Another very cool theory is that it has to do with the maneuverability. If you have control thrusters on the forward pod to counteract thrusters on the rear section of the ship, this yields excellent torque and pitch. This kind of works because the further out you have your reaction control thrusters from a ship's center of mass, the more easily you can affect its maneuvers. Other thrusters in the nacelles or other parts of the ship would easily take care of the rest of the maneuvering. Perhaps we can keep this theory as one of the reasons for the design. Another popular theory is that the ship's shape affects the warp field around the ship, allowing for faster warp speeds. The Star Trek technobabble word for this is warp field geometry. The idea being that subspace, or the nature of space according to Einstein's general theory of relativity, is somewhat fluidic if it can be warped and manipulated. So an angular warp bubble can be produced here. So this also could be part of the reason for the design, but why not just make a more structurally stable triangular shape instead, something like a Star Destroyer, if you're going to design a warship. So here we can keep this theory as another part of the reason for the design, but still not the definitive reason. And now for the final theory, the idea that there is danger in either of these sections of the ship, warranting some separation. 
When I first saw this ship as a kid, I thought that the forward section was all part of a dangerous weapon and was kept safely away from the main hull of the ship so that it could operate safely. Of course, I was wrong. The situation seems to be the opposite. The officers command from this forward section, and they live here too, as if they are deliberately protected from the rear section. Some think the entire crew bunks up here, but that cannot be the case since there really isn't enough room for a bridge, sensors, and crew quarters for several hundred crew up here. The bulk of the crew still has to live and operate in this rear section. The best theory for this is that the radiation coming from the antimatter reactor and engineering back here is rather dangerous, too dangerous to expose the most important members of the crew. But why would Klingons implement such a blatantly heartless design? Don't they care about their crew at all? Yeah, maybe so, maybe not. Perhaps the first versions of these ships were capable of an enormous power output, all in preparation for the much anticipated war with the Federation. D7s were mass produced and rushed into service, capable of reaching high warp speeds and powering all their weapons due to their new power core. At a price, of course. In the early days, a lot of the crew that works and lives back here may have in fact been another species altogether. The Klingons conquered many civilizations and used servitor races called Kuv for many jobs in their society. And they may have been a race that was either enslaved and forced to work back here, or more likely a race that has a higher natural resistance to radiation. They may also have simply been a lower class of Klingon, those that do not have a prominent house and and perhaps they are offered hazard pay and benefits to work in these dangerous conditions. To me, it does not seem to be efficient to use slaves to work aboard a sophisticated starship, but another theory is that if there were ever a mutiny or revolt, the officers in the forward section would be safe, and still in some degree of control. I think this theory of radiation is a very valid one, and I'll take it, although it still isn't optimal, but by the time the Klingons improved the safety of the reactors on these old ships, there were already so many of them that they continued to upgrade and use them rather than mass produce an entirely new design. As far as the structural integrity issues of the neck, although certainly this is some kind of weakness, it may not have been a severe enough one to worry about. For one thing, there is no reason why this neck couldn't be one of the most armored parts of the ship. It is also not nearly as easy to hit as the main drive section, which is undoubtedly the part that will be taking most of the hits. And finally, pure structure tanking is not something that is preferred in Star Trek. In most Star Trek battles, if the shields are down, everyone suddenly catches all kinds of anxiety. Most ships in Star Trek rely on shields as their primary defense, not the hull. As long as your ships have good shield technology, you can design the hull to do other things, such as maneuver well. So what we probably have here in the D7 and all its variants is a battle cruiser designed to perform well at warp and impulse, deliver firepower from weapons with optimal effect, and to achieve all this well requires some sacrifice in crew safety. To mitigate this, this ship is modular. These ships are also a very traditional shape in the Klingon fleet and Klingons value tradition, so they would rather make the best out of a ship that suits their personality than abandon the classic D7 design altogether. Thanks for watching, space friends. Please like, subscribe, and feel free to say, well, actually, in the comment section. Stay tuned for screw ups or retakes. Thanks for watching, space friends. Please like, subscribe, and feel retake. Okay, let's review the basics of the D7 bass retake <laughs> let's start retake or a disruptor cannon uh, on the front retake this kind of works because the further out you have reaction control thrusters retake this kind of works because the further out you have your reaction control thrusters from retake the offers in the for retake <laughs>